And uh, good to see each of you here this morning. If you would open your Bibles to Romans chapter 2, <clears throat> Romans chapter 2, and let's trek through that. Uh, when I was a boy growing up in rural churches, there was a common expression that I would hear adults make. And uh, of course, as a boy growing up, I thought everybody over 30 uh, was ancient. And uh, we had about the same mix we do here, just less folk. But there was an expression that would often be used to the pastor. Well, he stopped preaching and gone to meddling. And I feel like that's what the Apostle Paul is doing. I, Paul, you quit preaching back in chapter 1, and this chapter 2 is a meddlesome chapter. But it is a chapter we need. Now, in the book of Romans, Paul is taking us on a journey. Uh, he is taking us on the journey to see the sinfulness of all humanity regardless of who, whether it's Jew, Gentile, or whatever. And in this passage of Scripture, certainly not every Jew was guilty of what Paul talked about, but in the conversation, <clears throat> he had already brought the pagan Gentile crowd into it and talked about all of the sins of the pagan Gentiles. And I can just see the typical church and these Jewish Christians, many of them in Rome, they were probably sitting there, amen, amen, go Paul, that's exactly right. And then he turns and says, but you. Now that's where it gets to meddling. And uh, we've read part of the scripture, but the warnings that he gave us then are true for us today. And so I want to begin reading uh, in chapter 2 of 25 and finish that text, and then let's go back and look at it and, and try to break it apart and see what the apostle is teaching us for the world in which you and I live. In verse 25, he says, circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. If those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have not the written code in circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. So what is he saying to us here? Uh, first of all, he is warning us to practice what we preach. Very easy for religious people to know the precepts and the concepts, quote the scriptures, and maybe have memory verses in our background from vacation Bible school or otherwise, and, and yet at the same time not live what we're saying for others to live. That is easy for us to fall into. It is a religious trap, and there are many religious traps. It is profession without po possession, and in verse 24, he says that blasphemes the name of God. So when you and I don't live what we preach, and I'm not talking about sinless perfection because we all fail in all of these areas, in many of these areas, but we're constantly trying to repair relationships. We're constantly trying to repair most of all our relationship with the Lord and walk with Him in spirit and in truth. But if we don't do that, that blasphemes the name of God. And Jesus said of His generation in chapter 15 and verse 6 of Matthew's gospel, He's talking about God's commandments versus man's traditions. And in verse 3, Jesus replied and said, why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is a gift devoted to God. In other words, mom and dad, I can't help you because this is going to the church. It's that kind of attitude. And uh, uh, he, he says that uh, he is not to honor, he is not to honor his father and mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. 
Now, that's the crowd of Jews that Paul was speaking of. The word Jew comes from the tribe of Judah, and it was a people group, a special group. But not every Jew followed the Lord. We'll get into that in just a few moments in those verses 25 and forward on circumcision. But he's talking about the Jew that has become a Christian that is in the Christian church and yet is not living it. That could be true of Jew, that could be true of Gentile, and certainly for our application today, it is true that every one of us must seek to practice what we preach. We err. There are several things that we err in this area, just as did the Pharisees. We err when we think good works have merit toward godliness. If I just work hard enough and I just do the right things and if I'm just so perfect in the human sphere and everything, then surely that is going to merit godliness. What Paul is teaching us is there is nothing that you and I can ever do or say that merits the grace of God. Everything that we have is a gift from God. Grace is a gift through faith. And so he, he's building layer after layer, precept upon precept, to let us know the sinfulness of all humanity, and then he will turn to the gospel and to the grace of God in later chapters. Uh, we also err when we think that we're entitled or better than. I'll tell you, in my travel through churches and talking with people in, in my, uh, before I came here in my former career, I I would have people of different economic strata, of different race, of different age, that they wouldn't call names, but they would tell me that there are people here that think they're just a little bit better than everybody else. And you get that all the time if you go out on these streets and start talking to people and how those that have left the church feel about the church and how those that don't attend the church feel about the church. Eh, Those folks, they just think they're better than everybody. You know, it used to be the argument the church is full of hypocrites. And I would always say, yeah, we are. Every one of us are hypocritical in some point at some time. But we're working, we're asking the Spirit to change our lives, to transform our lives. Now what you hear is, They just think they're better than everybody else. They're so condemning. They're so judgmental. Now, I understand a part of that is because of truth that we stand for as opposed to the error and untruth of a secular world. I get that part of it. But what I want to work on in my own life is that in my stand for the truth, I don't have the attitude that I'm better than somebody else. I'm not, and neither are any of us, and we err when we do that. Uh, The Expositor's Bible, a commentary said, whatever feeds gross personal pride promotes a swift and deadly decay of moral fiber. Proverbs says pride goes before destruction. Prideful people are bound for a haughty fall. So church, we need to make sure that in our own personal life before the Lord Jesus, that we're not those people that feel entitled, that we're not those people that feel we're better than somebody else. But we are a humble people. We are walking with the Lord and we're seeking our heart on a daily basis and trying to repair every relationship that we know. Now this generic stuff, none of us can deal with that. But if we know something, we need to deal with the specifics as best as we can. We err. We can pervert privilege into pride. We can sink into judgment of others. That's a religious practice. That's what the Jews did. We're God's chosen. We're God's people. We can do this. We have more of God than you pagans do. And so they began to judge others. They began to judge motives. And only God can do that. The Bible tells us, Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged. For the same things you're judging others about, you're doing yourself. That's what he said to his generation. I haven't seen a change in that. I I hate to confess that I'm one of these 
that's been guilty at different times of that. And I've always had to come back and I've always had to repent. And I want to tell you something. The general thing you have where people say, some have said, that's so generic. That's not God. That's not the Holy Spirit. That's judgmentalism and that's Satan trying to heap a guilt trip. But here's the Holy Spirit. Ted, you sinned when you said such and such, when you did such and such. Go make that relationship right. And if we're open to the Holy Spirit, He'll lead us. And it may take time. It may take humbling yourself. It, it may take not saying anything. Sometimes we don't even know what to do until the Lord opens the door. But that's how we avoid a judgmental spirit. We listen to the Holy Spirit who seeks to transform our lives, who seeks to bring us back into alignment with the purpose and the will of God. When negative things happen to us, and they do, I am learning, I have not yet learned this, <clears throat> not to ask the why question, but to just say, Lord, what's your purpose in this? How are you going to fulfill your purpose? What, what am I supposed to do? And I'm finding inch by inch. These are not giant steps, but these are inch by inch steps. And God leads us. The whole song came out of my childhood. God leads his dear children along. I think it's in the hymn book somewhere. I love that song. That's exactly true. When we don't understand, God leads us along. So William Newell summarized uh, God's judgment in Romans chapter 2 as opposed to our judgment. And he says these things about it in chapter 2. And if you're looking at your Bible and you want to underline them, God's judgment in chapter 2 verse 2 is according to truth. In chapter 2 verse 5, God's judgment is accumulated guilt. It's according to accumulated guilt. In verse 6, God's judgment is according to works. In verse 11, it's without partiality. <coughs> In verse 13, His judgment is about performance and not knowledge. In verse 16, it reaches the secrets of our hearts. Oh, the secrets that we do keep. The secrets of our hearts that God wants to free us from, that God wants to work. And I'm not saying all of those secrets ought to become public to everybody, but sometimes those things we keep hidden beat us to death until we acknowledge them before God and until we're willing to come before Him clean and acknowledge it. Lord, this is me. God, forgive me. God, help me to know how to deal with this. God will set you free. He will give you wisdom. He will give you knowledge. God's judgment is also according to reality, not just religious profession. And that's very interesting that we also err when we rely on principle and forsake the promises of God. In our Christian experience, we can get to the point to where you and I are relying on certain methods, we're relying on certain principles, and we're more focused on them than we are on the promise that God has given through them. In other words, we'll talk about it in just a moment, but we're more interested in God's covenant with Abraham than we are the faith walk of Abraham, that the covenant was a sign of. See, it's more about faith and promise than it is precept. You can dot the I's and cross the T's and have a wicked hard heart. And so Paul is pulling the Jewish people and the Christians in that church, and I believe us today because we have the inspired word out of that kind of thing. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, we, we always talk about what we have done. 
And that can breed an antinomian, a person that's against the law. We sing free from the law, oh, happy condition. And that's true, we are. But at the same time, we're not freed to become lawbreakers. We are freed to obedience in a life of faith. We err when we lose sight of the kingdom of God. In Acts chapter 28, Paul arrived at Rome. He's writing this letter from Corinthians on the eve of his departure to Jerusalem with the offering for the saints, but it took him a long time to get to Rome, including arrest, et cetera, et cetera, and that's in the book of Acts. So here, the Jewish people of that church arranged to meet Paul on a certain date. Now, these were folks that had believed Jesus was the Messiah, and they were coming, and there were a lot of other Jews that didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. So they came to hear Paul on this certain date, and the Bible says he declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. So here you have him preaching to the Jews in the church about Jesus the Messiah and about the kingdom of God. And dear brothers and sisters, you and I can err when we lose sight that this is about the kingdom of God. Not anybody else's kingdom, but the kingdom of God. And that's why obedience and faith are required. And we see that most clearly when we're warned in chapter 20, I'm uh, chapter 2, verse 25 through 29, that symbols of faith are not the faith. I'll talk about three. Circumcision is prominent in this text, but let's talk about baptism and the Lord's Supper because those are ordinances of the Baptist Church and most other evangelical churches today, regardless of what the denomination is. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, true godliness is the natural outgrowth of a renewed nature, not the, forth, the forced growth of pious, hothouse excitement. It's natural. It comes out of our walk with the Lord. And so Paul mentions circumcision. He says it has value if you observe the law. And as it goes on through this, he talks about the Jewish person that does not observe the law, does not obey God, but is circumcised and counting on his circumcision, and it's nothing. And that's true in the Christian church for baptism and the Lord's Supper, for our ordinances. If we just do them for the sake of doing them, they mean nothing. I went to another denomination. A person was coming into that denomination. And Cheryl and I were invited a number of years ago, and the whole service was written out, and there probably must have been 60 people of all ages from late teenagers into elderly people that were becoming a part of that particular church. And the pastor led them through all of the ceremony, every bit of it, all of the ceremony. They quoted Scripture they said things that anybody in this room would have agreed with. They were right out of Scripture. They made their vows to God, and it was almost like what we would call the believer's prayer that I lead people in almost every Sunday morning. And when it was over, and he was a rather hefty fellow, and he wore a robe. I've always wanted one of those robes, but I don't want a white one. I'll spill my salsa and chips on the white robe, so I don't want white. But anyway, I always wanted to meet him, and I never got to. He went to the front pew when it was over, and they had all of those people that were converting into that denomination there. And he propped his leg up on uh, the pew, and he looked over at them, and he said, now I want to say something to you. He said, everything you have just read, everything you have just said, everything you have just promised God is worthless unless you meant it in your heart. And I thought, I like that. That's right down the line with Scripture. And what did they do? Circumcision. Abraham. In chapter 17 of Genesis, 
was commanded to be circumcised and to circumcise all of his people and every male was to be circumcised. Abraham was 99 years old. Think of that. And he circumcised his whole family. It was a sign that they were brought in to the family of God. But it was not a believing sign on the person that was circumcised because the command from that day forward was to circumcise the male on the eighth day. An eight-day-old baby cannot make a profession of faith or trust Jesus. They can barely do anything but squirm and make a mess. So it was a sign. It was a sign. Baptism is a sign. From the New Testament on, the Christian church has always practice baptism upon profession of faith. That's why it's called believer's baptism. But it's a sign. It's an out. of that cup and take of that bread and we imbibe. We're looking back to what Jesus did at the cross for us in resurrection and we're looking forward to what he is going to do in his second coming. But without faith in our heart, it means nothing. It's just the worst tasting bread you'll ever have in your mouth and sugared up grape juice. For Baptists, there are some denominations that do the real stuff. Do you see what I'm saying? Religious signs are not faith. Religious signs are there to demonstrate that we believe. And if we don't, if there's a contradiction between what we practice and what we say, we blaspheme the name of God. That's what Paul is writing to these about. I know that there are many denominations that will take baptism and uh, make it uh, on par uh, with Old Testament circumcision, and so they will baptize infants. Now, I don't know one of those that believes that that infant is saved forever. I had a Presbyterian pastor. In fact, Billy Graham's uh, brother-in-law, Clayton Bell, pastored Highland Park Presbyterian. We were on a flight from Atlanta back to Dallas and we had conversation about that. And as best as I understand it, in their church, that, that was a sign. It was a bringing them into the covenant family and parents promising to raise their children so that at a time when they could understand that they would genuinely accept Christ. But it wasn't to save them. And circumcision was not to save them. It was to bring them into that covenant family, the family of God. And when they were, and I did research on this, when, when the young man was somewhere around 12 or 13 years of age, they went to the temple, and it was not bar mitzvah. That is an invention of the 1800s, late 1800s. But they would go to the temple, and they would affirm their commitment to the faith of their fathers and the God of and father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You see, for the sign to mean anything, we have to have faith in our heart. We have to trust, or otherwise it's just a religious work, and it's brought about by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moves in our lives, moves in our hearts, transforms us. And the value of the sign is to lead us to believing God, to trusting God, to following Him. And faith is all over this. Now, none of these dispense grace. Only God dispenses grace through Christ. And it's undeserved. And in 
Ephesians chapter two, that passage is so clear. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that's not of yourself. It's a gift of God. so that no one should boast. No one should brag except in the Lord Jesus. Paul in chapter one spoke of my gospel. Spurgeon commented he felt that he should not live in the midst of so depraved a people without holding the gospel with both hands and grasping it as his very own. Church, I wanna ask you today, Are we holding the gospel and grasping it as our very own? Or have we turned loose of the gospel depending on what we do, who we are, how much I know? My goodness, I've preached all these years. You'd think that when I stand before the Lord, I could say, God, I spent a lifetime sharing your gospel. I went here, I went there, I did this. And and look at my back, Lord. I don't have your scars, but I've got some. You think that gets me anything? No. No. Only the shed blood of Christ gospel, the good news, where I in faith trusted him and he forgave and cleansed all of my sins and made me fit and person of heaven. Every symbol from my baptism to every time I've taken of the Lord's Supper, all of that was nothing more than a testimony of what Jesus has done inside my life. And the same should be true of you. The Apostle Paul wrote that marvelous letter of Galatians. And he concluded in Galatians 6, 14, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I mean, you think about it. When we came to Christ, This world died to us, and and we died to it. That's why when some of you became a Christian, just like Cheryl and I, we quit getting invited to some parties we used to get invited to. And we never condemned them. They just stopped inviting us. And then he goes on in verse 15 and says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation a new creation. That's where we're going in Romans. Next week, we'll pick up more about the Jewish and the uh, the people and the benefits that they had and the value that they had when God chose them to be a people. But today, I want to ask you a question. Are you a new creation? Because if you're the same thing you've always been, there's been no transformation of your life you've really never been transformed by the grace of God. You've just brushed up on some repairs. And I'll tell you, sometimes for those of us that were raised in Christian homes and raised in churches, we are the most difficult ones to understand that we too are sinners. Let me illustrate it like this. My little daughter, when she was seven years old, had never, ever smoked a cigarette, had sex, used a curse word. She had never done any of that. When I was on the police department, there was a prostitute, and I've told you this story in another context that I began to share the gospel with, with using Campus Crusades for Spiritual Laws. And Shirley Warren was her street name, and she, she was a street prostitute. And Shirley, one night, bowed her head in a police car and gave her life to Jesus. 
Beth, at seven years of age, in a GA camp in Brownwood, Texas, gave her life to Jesus. Two beautiful young ladies, poles apart in lifestyle. But it took the same blood of Jesus shed at the cross to save the seven-year-old good girl as it did the 23-year-old street prostitute. And the same with us. We come by the way of the cross. That's the grace of God, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And nothing that we have done but everything that he has done. So would you bow your head with me today?